Okay, so let me pull you back together. Um, More than anything, what I want to do as we go through this next um, hour or so together is just to give you a sense to make sure that you are keeping in front of you as concrete a problem as possible. Um, one of the things we've learned is that training people to think in new ways, the more concrete, the better. We do better going from the concrete to the abstract than from the abstract to the concrete. So let me have you think about it this way. So if you know the name Ed Friedman, Ed Friedman was a famous uh, systems thinker. Um, he was a, a, a rabbi of a large congregation in Washington. D.C. He was a marriage and family therapist, and he was a consultant in Washington, D.C. So he used to say that he saw dysfunction at every level. And, um, and he describes congregations this way. Now think about the problem that you just talked about from this notion. He said, when any relationship system is imaginatively gridlocked, just notice that phrase for a second, imaginatively gridlocked. Think about the last council meeting you were in, the last faculty meeting you were in, right? When any relationship system is imaginatively gridlocked, it cannot get free simply through more thinking about the problem. Conceptually stuck systems cannot be unstuck simply by trying harder. For a fundamental reorientation to occur, that spirit of adventure which optimizes serendipity and which enables new perceptions beyond the control of our thinking processes must happen first. Notice what he says here. When you're stuck, don't try harder. When you're stuck, instead, you need to find a way to rethink of the problem in a new way. And that starts with a spirit of adventure. And by spirit of adventure, what he means here is that there's two requirements. Number one is that to be a genuine adventure, it's going to require learning. And number two, it's going to result in loss. For us to move from our unstuck place, we have to prepare ourselves to, be, to know that wherever we are, we're going to have to learn new ways and new things, and it's going to, we're going to face loss. And for many of us, even learning is a loss. Uh, for those of us who have master of divinity in front of our names, or doctor of the church, or doctor of ministry, or doctor of theology, when we have become the experts that people have looked to, when we have literally been brought into a congregation to solve the very problem that you just talked about, when everybody expects us to be the expert, then the, one of the things we have to recognize is that psychologically, the three hardest words to say are not, I love you, or I forgive you. They are, I don't know. And that to be in, a, in this moment when you're sitting here staring at the Rocky Mountains and your entire training has taught you to run rivers, the very next thing you will be asked, what should we do? And the right answer is, I don't know. But it is profoundly difficult to stand in front of a group of people who hired you to be the person who knows and to be the first person to acknowledge, I don't know. Eric Hoffer puts it this way, in times of great change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. And this is where so many of us find ourselves today. We find ourselves longing for the past because we were beautifully equipped for that world. That world worked for many of us. That wor what world was the world that where we were masters of our fate. And now we are seizing to go back. We want to go back. We are clinging to it because of it. So think again about that challenge in the church that you just can't get traction on. That issue that you, no matter how hard you work on it, it just keeps coming back. Think about why it keeps coming back and what is the nature of those challenges. If it was something that could have been solved, I believe it would have already been solved. So the very fact that it isn't means that the nature of that church is that it is a systemic challenge with no clear answer. This language comes from the work of Ronald Heifetz and Marty Linsky. And what Linsky and Heifetz help us do is help us to do a radical thing, which is not to solve our problems, but to learn to see them before we solve them. To learn to step out of the problem and look at it differently. To try to have that change of perception that will enable a serendipity of a new way of thinking 
that it starts by not reverting back to the old solutions. So what Heifetz and Linsky do is they talk about it this way. They say that in every problem, you have technical problems and you have adaptive challenges. That the very first thing you should do when you're facing a problem is try to discern, is it a technical problem or is it an adaptive challenge? Now, a technical problem doesn't mean a technological one, like my friends were helping me with the microphones. It could be, but it's not. What a technical problem means is a technical problem is a problem that can be solved by an expert. So a technical problem is the application of current knowledge, skills, and tools to resolve a situation. So if your problem can be solved by an expert, then it's a technical problem. A technical problem doesn't mean it's a trivial problem. A technical problem can be a deeply complex problem. A heart bypass is a technical problem. But an adaptive challenge is one where there isn't any expertise within the system, when it, where it cannot be solved with one's existing knowledge, skills, and tools. And instead, it requires people to, and look closely at this list of words, make a shift in values, expectations, attitudes, or habits of behavior. How easily do people shift values, expectations, attitudes, or habits of behavior? Adaptive challenges are systemic problems with no clear answers. Again, let me be really clear. Not every problem is an adaptive challenge. Some are technical problems, and some of those technical problems are problems experts can solve. Some of you are those people. Um, interpreting difficult tech, biblical texts are a technical problem. It can be done. It's just hard to do. Holding a community together and caring for people is a technical problem. We train people to do so. Um, being with people in grief or loss is a technical problem. I was, I was 26 years old the first time that I ever had someone die when I was a clinical pastoral education student. I had three people die on the same day. By the time I was 28, I had buried a child who'd been beaten by his gang member father in a grave and nine months later buried his mother who died of lupus triggered by the grief and had to explain and work with my young adult congregation through that pain. But we train people to do so. You have been the people who have done so. You're the people that people turn to in grief and in loss when marriages are falling apart, when there's ethical decisions to make. Those are complex and difficult problems, but they're problems that an expert and a well-trained and wise person can solve. Adaptive challenges are challenges that we can't. They require learning. They result in loss. So let's be clear. When I fly home tomorrow morning, I don't want an adaptive pilot. <laughs> I don't want there to be any learning or any loss on that particular flight. I don't believe in adaptive dentistry, right? There's just certain things that I, you want an expert to do. And if an expert can solve it, then do it. And what some of you are realizing is that some of you were hired by your church and called by your church to be the technical solution to the problem that you're talking about. And that's why it feels so fraught. Because it cannot be solved. And because it cannot be solved, it requires that we start with understanding that there will be learning and we confront the fact that there will be loss and we, are telling, we have to lead people through a process of shifting in values, expectations, attitudes, and habits of behavior. And you have to discern what are you willing to shift and what if we shift the wrong things, we lose who we are. So adaptive leadership requires wisdom and discernment, and communities of people working through challenges together. So let me give you some key principles to think through how to arm your, your team and how to start thinking differently than a technical solution. What most of us do when we face a challenge is we go back to our technical solutions. We go back to whatever worked before. We double down. We paddle harder. But instead, what we have to recognize is that the very first adaptive principle is that people will resist it. 
You know you're in an adaptive challenge when you are now facing the resistance of the very people who are asking you to solve the problem. And the reason why is that the first principle of adaptive challenges is that people don't resist change, they resist loss. And the very first thing we are facing with our people who asked us to lead them into a new day is that we have to help them face the loss of the things that are the most dear to them. You know what it's like. Tell someone in your congregation that we're going to have to change this and have them look at you and have them re- help you realize that they start saying stuff like, I don't feel as if I'm at home in my own home church. I remember when I was a young pastor, when, when, our, when our senior pastor went off to be the chaplain of the Senate, all of a sudden I was, like a, I was like a battlefield lieutenant who all of a sudden started preaching. And this guy who had been spent the better part of seven years down in a basement working with college students was all, all of a sudden on the platform preaching to the congregation. And a woman would walk up to me every single week after, after I preached. She would walk up to me and she'd go, hi, Pastor Todd, I just wanted to introduce you to myself. I, my name's Martha. I said, Mar- Martha, I've been here for years. I've known you forever. Well, I just want to make sure that you knew who I was. I wasn't sure. There's so many people at the church. Bye. See you next time. Okay. Next time I preach, first person to come greet me. Hi, Pastor Todd. Remember me? It's Martha. I'm like, yeah, Martha, nice to see you again. Thank you for greeting me. Says, hey, do you know that my husband, my late husband, he worked for Boeing. He was really involved. And I mean, when they, when, and, and he worked for Lockheed. And when Lockheed closed, he went through some time. But he was a great man, a good provider. I'm like, thank you, Martha. That's great to know. Thanks very much. Good. See you next, see you. Okay. Next time she walks up to me again. Hi, Pastor Todd, it's Martha. Remember me? My husband worked for Lockheed, worked for Boeing. Remember us? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, do you know my adult children? They're both lovely. They've moved away, but they're wonderful people. One's a school teacher. One's... Uh, okay. I'm, I'm thinking, why am I getting this family history from Martha every time I preach? So every single time she would find me, every single time she would talk to me, finally I looked at her. I said, Martha, uh, I know you well. We spent a lot of time together. Why is this so important? She looked at me and she said, Todd, you're the last pastor here who knows me. And when I die, I don't want a stranger doing my funeral at a church that I've been at my whole life. See you next week on the patio, Martha. Let's spend some more time talking, right? People don't resist change, they resist loss. And for you and me, this is actually good news. For those of us sitting in this room who've been trained to help people deal with loss, it means that leadership starts with the exact same place that most of us are called to do, which is to go with people into their grief and into their loss. Our problem is that we're not used to dealing, helping people deal with loss when they blame us for it. But it's still loss. It requires learning, and it results in loss. For most of us, the most radical disruption of your leadership style is that you're going to have to get do what um, Heifetz says, get beyond win-win. For most of us, our favorite way of working through any problem is to find a win-win solution. Of course we can find a win-win. Of course we can compromise. Adaptive challenges require that someone is going to lose something. It might mean 1-1-A. It might mean because this group has been first, now this group will be first. It might mean that we are going to take turns. It might mean that we are going to restructure things and reorganize things. But you're not going to be able to get to win-win solutions on genuine adaptive challenges. They will mean navigating and helping people deal with loss. Principle number one, people don't resist change, they resist loss. Principle number two, for change to last, it must be a healthy adaptation of the DNA of the group. Adaptive challenges are built on the notion that living, flourishing systems healthy organisms when in a different changing environment learn to adapt they they flourish by adapting and it's the healthiest version of their core dna you don't change your identity you find the healthiest version of your identity in this new environment and so one of the things that we do we do when we walk in to talk to people is that we say the first thing you've got to do is get really really clear on your sense of congregational identity Who are we? Why do we exist? What are our core values? And I want to warn you, by core values, I don't mean your aspirational values. 
Almost every time that I've gone into work with the church, I've said, oh, we want to spend some time talking about your values. They go, oh, great, we have a set of values. We have a whole set of core values. We all get together. We put them, we have them on the wall. We say them all the time. They're on the back of our bulletin. They're great. And I look at the list of them, and I realize almost every single time those values are wonderful, but they are aspirational values. They're what we wish to be and want to be and hope to be, not who we are. And for change to last, it must be a healthy adaptation of our actual DNA. How do you get to it? A couple of things. You explore your past. Uh, some years ago, when I was at, Holly, at San Clemente Presbyterian, we went through this large process where we had to work together to decide. We decided that we were going to tear down all of our buildings and rebuild our entire campus. We wanted to be a multi-generational congregation. And we discovered that one of the things that happened in our, camp, in our congregation was that when they built the buildings, they literally took the old sanctuary that was now our most beloved chapel and it was in the center of the campus and the older people would come out of the people without kids would come out of the sanctuary would walk out into a beautiful patio with an ocean view and would stay there for hours developing deep friendships but everybody who had kids had to go to pick up their kids in the play area which was around the chapel through a parking lot into another playground we literally had two generations of a church divided by our beloved chapel. What we, we would say all the time to the younger families, oh, please, the patio is lovely. Go pick up your kids and bring them back. We'll put the best coffee and the donuts on the patio. You'll love it. It'll be great. And we'd have parents look at us saying, you think I'm going to take my five-year-old back through a parking lot? Are you kidding? And so they would go and they would leave. And we were literally divided by our past. And so after years of working it out, we realized the only solution was to tear down our chapel. It was to literally tear down the building that most of our older congregation had been married in or had been baptized in. And some of them had buried their loved ones in. They'd worshipped in that up until 20 years earlier. It was the most beloved place on our campus. And I had to literally go to them and ask them to tear down that chapel and pay for the rebuilding of the campus so that we could make a way for the new generation. And two weeks after 9-11, a group of mostly older people in the church voted to do so, and we tore it down. We led into a nine-year period of dust and distraction and disruption and debt that took us until we were going to finally redo the entire, the entire campus so that we could literally be a multi-generational community that worshipped and fellowshiped together. All the time that we were going through that transition, all that time, we had this picture that was put up and blown up almost this big. And it was in the narthex looking out at all of the construction. This is the picture. This picture came from our church's history. This picture was found actually in City Hall in San Clemente. For years it hung in City Hall, and there was a caption. The caption now says, First Sunday School Held on Beach at San Clemente. But for years when it was in City Hall, somebody had covered it up, and the caption said, Early Marine Biology Class. <laughs> Which is why for years nobody knew that it was a church. It was from a church. Until finally they were took it down, someone peeled off the label, discovered that it was a Sunday school class, turned it over and discovered it was from our church and sent us this. And so what we did is we took this, we blew it up and we put it there. And we said, this is our history. This is why we're doing our building program. So you notice some things about this. First of all, there ain't no building in this picture. What we were trying to say to our people is this wasn't about buildings. This is about this picture. Everything we were doing with buildings, they could come up and they could go down. They would be built for a moment or for a year. The buildings were not about the buildings. The buildings were about this, about being a multi-generational congregation that cares and values every generation. And people would notice that there were children and adults together. And then they would notice that there was a woman teaching Tells you the power of this. We're Presbyterians. We believed in the women's ordination for over 40 years. But until this picture went up, we'd never had a woman pastor. This picture went up, and they've had four since. And the most important thing is that she's holding that big old Bible that reminded us that any decision we made was going to be ultimately about what we believe the Scripture asked us to be. 
that whatever our changes were going to be, they were going to be a healthy version of this. Now, you may not have a picture like this out of your archives that you can go to, but I'll tell you what you do have. You have stories. So here's what you can do. You can go home this week and do this. Gather people together. Put them in circles. Make the, make the circles as diverse as you can make them. Make them with people who are brand new to the church and people who've been there forever and people of different generations and different races and backgrounds and political views. But just the only thing they have in common is they call this church home and they love this place. Find the people who love this place and get them together and have them tell stories. Tell a story about a hero. I would tell a story about Ruth who would come up to me every single week after I finished preaching and all the years that I was, we were in the middle of that building project and she would walk up to me every week and she would say, I'm praying for you again, boy. I prayed for you again this week, boy. I pray for you every day, boy. She got away with calling me boy. Everybody else called me Reverend Dr. Boy. And I remember looking at her once and said, Ruth, I, your prayers matter to me. Thank you for telling me this. You know, I'm so glad. Would you mind this week praying more? People are really getting to get impatient with this whole building thing. They don't like it. They're getting anxious. We're getting a lot of stuff. One guy, the pastor in church in the town called this Todd's Temple. It's just getting more criticism. She goes, oh, I don't pray for that. I pray every week that no matter whatever else we do here, you never forget that your first job is to be faithful to the scriptures. Your first job is to teach us Genesis to Revelation every week. You're to lead us in all the things. It's about that. That's what I pray for. Don't ever forget that. Yes, ma'am. Tell a story about a cherished moment that's told over and over again. Tell a story about the place. Somebody tell a story about the way in which someone will say, this is what we're really about. This is the moment I was most proud of us. This is when I knew I'd found my people. And those stories will tell you your genuine values. This is who we really are. Two weeks after 9-11, I stood in front of a whole group of people who were completely nervous about the future and told them that I needed them to tear down their beloved chapel and I needed them to pay for it. And they said yes to it. It was stunning. And for the next 15 years, I would basically say to every group of new people of the church, this is a church that welcomed you, that knew you were coming. We tore down our buildings to find us, make a space for you. We want, your, we want to be a three-generation church. We want you to come, and we want you to bring your parents, and we want you to bring your kids. We want this to be a place where all of our generations together can worship, and we're willing to make any changes. We'll, we'll sacrifice anything to be with you. And it was a beautiful thing to be able to say so. Nine years go by. We finished the, cap- the building campaign. We finished the building project. We remodeled our sanctuary. And I get a call at 7 o'clock one morning telling me that a man had broken into our sanctuary and had destroyed our baptismal font and broken our baptismal table and had tried to break our windows and had broken a bunch of our chairs and had tried to vandalize the place. And they found him passed out on the chancel naked. They put him in a squad car. They threw some clothes over him. He finally was coming around, and I came, met him, found out that he was a Marine who had just gotten back from Afghanistan. He said that what he'd seen over there, he'd made one vow that he would someday, as soon as he got home, he would find a place where he could curse God and die. And he came to our church to do it. People in our church came around him, and a Marine family really adopted him. They made sure that his dignity was protected and his identity was protected and that he was loved. We reached out to his parents, and his parents told him that he'd grown up in a church, but he had been, become so disillusioned that was, he was now kind of stunned that these people didn't just kick him out, that he wanted to actually make restitution and wanted to make it right. And so a group of people came around him, and four months later, he took communion at the same spot where he had once cursed God. That's the church I raised my children in. When my young adult children sat next to me five years ago when we, wa- when we said goodbye to the congregation, both of my young adult children asked for the microphone to say, we are Christians today because we saw Jesus in this church. Let's be clear, n- neither one of my children would probably go back to that church. Both of my children have different beliefs. They've, come, they've gone and they've had their own faith. They've integrated it in a different way. 
I don't think they would go back and be members of that church today. But they, but they know Jesus and they have a vibrant faith because they learned it there. What are the values of your congregation? And your adaptive changes must be a healthy adaptation of who you are. 